Once upon a time, their inhabitants used to battle against wind, waves, and isolation. Now they're harnessing the forces of nature to provide clean energy. Islands of the future. Role models for the whole world. It's the island of fire and ice, Iceland. The Icelanders were the first people in Europe to learn how to make use of the heat from the volcanic earth. Nowadays, the forces of nature are securing their survival. Hundreds of rivers flow down from the highlands to the coast. The clean energy of these wild waters has already made Icelanders independent of electricity from coal, oil or nuclear power. But there are growing doubts about the potential threat green energy might also pose to Iceland's unique landscape. Icelanders love bathing. Only a few villages have a pub, but there are swimming pools everywhere. The pool is the social meeting place. People often chat for hours in the hot water about work, gossip and politics. Hildigunur Torsteinsson often comes with her daughter to Reykjavik's West Pool. She has a special relationship to hot water. As an engineer with the local energy provider, she also supplies the city's swimming pools. It's a favorite place to meet up here. Hot water is thought of as something we've always had. People relax here and don't think about the energy this place consumes. The hot pools are typical of the way Icelanders handle energy. It's simply there and in excess. You wouldn't suspect that at first glance. Reykjavik, the northernmost capital in the world, is almost at the Arctic Circle. The summers are cool, the winters long, hard and dark. But the town, like the whole country, is sitting on hot treasure. Inconspicuous silver structures stand at many street corners in Reykjavik. The steam that rises from them comes directly from underground. Hilde Gunur and her colleagues pump scalding hot water out of over 50 well shafts in the city, each several hundred meters deep. The whole of Iceland sits on a bubbling cauldron, and the fire never goes out. Iceland is precisely situated on the fault line where the European and American continental plates are moving apart by two centimeters a year. The result, hot molten rock is forced to the surface where it forms volcanoes and brings the groundwater to a boil.
In all parts of the country, there are places where the heat comes to the surface on its own. Here, there are mud springs of unreal colors caused by minerals dissolved in the depths. Hot sulfurous fumes stink of rotten eggs. And countless pools simmer away. The biggest attractions are the geysers. In them, the pressure of the scalding water deep in the earth explodes into the air. The Icelanders exploit this geothermal energy on a grand scale. At the foot of the Hengidl volcano, just half an hour's drive from the center of Reykjavik, engineers have sunk deep boreholes into the earth. Under each of the futuristic domes, hot steam is shooting up from a depth of two kilometers. The volcano has been dormant for 2,000 years, but it heats the water below to over 300 degrees Celsius. This borehole is due for maintenance work today, so the superheated steam from below is shooting unharnessed into the sky. Hildigunur Torsteinsson has to ensure that all the boreholes always produce enough energy. If a source is exploited too quickly, it can run dry. She has great respect for the forces of nature. It all depends on the volcano. We know that Mother Earth calls the shots and we have to follow her. The pressure and heat in this spring have dropped. We don't yet know precisely why. We have to work with the volcano in the way it offers itself. Even if it's playing up at the moment, the volcano does offer the Icelanders quite a lot. Every second, hundreds of liters of water and steam flow out of the holes in the drilling field. A network of pipes transports its hot load down to the Headless Hedi power station. It's the most modern geothermic plant in Iceland. The engineers here use the energy from the depths of the earth in two ways. The water and steam are divided in the large gray separators. The water flows onto Reykjavik, while the steam is led into the machine hall. Here it drives four large turbines. Hedlis Hedi produces 300 megawatts, about as much as a medium-sized block in a coal-fired power station. Before we heated our buildings with water and generated electricity with geothermal energy, we used coal and oil. They had to be imported from abroad. Now we are energy self-sufficient. That's unique worldwide. The Icelanders generate not only all their electricity from renewable sources, but all the heat they need as well. The pipes from Hedlis Hedi lead to Reykjavik, where they reach 200,000 people. That's two out of three Icelanders.
The giant hot water tanks on the hill above the city symbolize just how much the energy from the depths of the earth has shaped Iceland. Iceland's hot water is a very special element in our society. It was very important for determining the pattern of settlement. It's the reason why, despite natural disasters like volcanic eruptions, earthquakes and an unfavorable climate, we're still here. It all began in a small way, though. For centuries, the Icelanders only made use of the hot springs that occurred naturally. They bathed in the hot water or washed their clothes in it. It was only in the 1930s and 40s that pipes were laid to bring the spring water to Reykjavik. The first buildings to be heated by the hot water were two schools, a hospital, and a swimming pool. But then the oil crises of the 1970s gave the decisive impetus. At the same time as the mighty tower of Hadalkrim's church was being completed, the Icelandic nation almost completely got rid of heating oil in their buildings. Now the whole land enjoys cheap and clean heating and a high standard of life. Geothermic energy was enormously important for the development of Iceland, despite the economic crisis, we're much better off today than 50 years ago, when we were a very poor nation. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Iceland is further blessed by a second and equally important source of energy water. The rain that falls in the vast, unpopulated highlands flows down in great rivers and plunges into the coastal plain in Europe's biggest waterfalls. Even more water is stored in the form of snow and ice in the gigantic glaciers. The biggest of them, the Vatnajökull, is up to 900 meters thick and covers an area three times the size of Luxembourg. In spring especially, huge quantities of milky meltwater swell the rivers. The Icelanders have built dams on some of the rivers, giving them clean hydroelectric energy all year round. Huge high tension lines transport the energy to where it's needed, on the coast.
This is where Iceland's biggest power consumers by far are situated. Heavy industrial plants, especially aluminium works. They consume around 75% of the electricity generated in the country. Omar Ragnarsson is a well-known journalist and TV presenter in Iceland. He's been covering the expansion of the aluminium industry for almost 50 years. His reports and documentaries have been seen by almost everybody in the country. He well remembers how it all began in Iceland at the end of the 1960s. We were an underdeveloped country at that time. We were well educated, everyone could read, but we only had gravel roads and dirt tracks. And we lived solely from fishing. 95% of our exports were fish. Then we got the offer of having foreign heavy industry come and build a large plant. I was all in favor of it at the time. The investors were attracted by the cheap energy available, since making aluminium uses vast amounts of electricity. The Icelanders built their first large-scale hydroelectric power station, especially for it. A win-win situation. The country got jobs, tax revenue, and the surplus electricity. The foreign aluminium company got cheap energy. Yeah, I was in favor of the power station and the aluminium smelting plant, even when it came to expanding it. But then, when a lot more power stations were planned to multiply electricity generation far beyond our own needs, then I had to think again. Further power stations were built throughout the country. And the power industry is still expanding. The potential is still far from being exhausted. The state-owned energy company, Landsvirkun, is planning new power stations to double the total capacity for hydroelectric energy. Every new construction site inflicts wounds on the landscape. Who's to benefit from the new dams, reservoirs and turbines? Iceland already produces five times more electricity than private households and businesses need, apart from heavy industry. More and more Icelanders are starting to doubt whether so much hydroelectric power really is a green, sustainable source of energy. Omar Ragnarsson is the most prominent critic. He's made it his mission in life to fight for Iceland's natural world. Despite his 75 years, he travels tirelessly. His small plane takes him all over the country. Omar wants to rouse Icelanders and show them how unique and unspoiled their country still is. Many people only know the area around the capital and the main tourist attractions nearby. like the historic Tingvedlia site of the ancient National Assembly. 
or Gulfos, the golden waterfall. But many Icelanders have never seen great expanses of the wild highlands. For decades, I've been trying to introduce Icelanders to their country, or rather, introduce the land and the people to each other. I traveled a lot as an entertainer and reporter, and I wanted to give that back to the people. I thought it would change people, Maybe it's changed some, but too few, I think. The plan is to make a dam above this uh, waterfall here. Omar is worried that the dams, hydroelectric power stations and factories are destroying his unique Iceland. For me, looking at the countryside is like the feeling of a young man looking at the beautiful woman he loves and fearing that she'll be made a slave and then killed. It's the same feeling. For some Icelanders, Omar's fears are no more than sentimentality. Like the president of the National 4x4 Club, who's out for a joyride with some of the club's members. The club has more members than any other in Iceland. All-terrain driving as a national pastime. The great heavy SUVs are to be seen on rough tracks and on Reykjavik shopping streets as well. None of the drivers has a guilty conscience about the enormous fuel consumption. For centuries, Icelanders had to struggle to survive in a barren environment. Many take a correspondingly pragmatic view of nature. <laughs> As you can see, it's nice and quiet here. Being out and about with good mates in beautiful countryside, that's what we want, enjoying nature. What may seem thoughtless and destructive at first glance still follows clear rules. As long as there's no snow about, the off-road vehicles can only use authorized tracks. The thin plant cover is too vulnerable. In recent years, an unusual alliance between car fans and nature conservationists has even developed. The reason is that we want to experience nature as unspoiled as possible. We don't want any power pylons, for instance. Nothing like that. We defend our right to drive such off-roaders in a natural setting. But our fundamental principle is to protect and enjoy nature. Omar Ragnarsson can use any help he can get in his battle for the highlands. The mixture of glaciers, volcanoes, desolate plateaus and hot springs is unique in the world. But only part of it is protected as a national park.
In the far east of the country, green energy has already made deep inroads into the landscape. This is Iceland's biggest dam. The Kauran Yukar Dam was built between 2003 and 2006, at a cost to the taxpayer of over a billion euros. Omar filmed the construction work at the time to show the whole country the impact being made on nature. He comes back here again and again. He's built an airstrip not far from the dam. Today, Omar is meeting the biologist and nature conservationist Mummi Gudbrandsson. The two of them together organized protests against the project 10 years ago. Looking at the rocky desert surrounding the lake for the first time, you might well wonder what nature there is to conserve here. But many square kilometers of countryside have disappeared beneath the milky glacier water behind the dam. What's being created is the deepest and third biggest lake in Iceland. Omar and Mummi were not able to stop the dam being built. But at the height of the protest, they organized the biggest demonstration in Iceland's history. For the first time, many Icelanders realized that clean water power could also do damage. Before the Kauranjuka power station, this was a region of untouched nature, far and wide. The river flowed from its source here into the gorge. There were green meadows here for sheep and wild animals. This area is something special because it's covered in greenery from the glacier to the sea. This was the deepest valley in the region, 180 meters deep. It was green here because it was well protected from the wind. These hydroelectric plants are so bad because it's always the best land that gets taken for the lake. That's a price that you simply can't justify. The conservationists lost the battle of the Kauran Yukar Dam. But they are committed to oppose any further expansion of hydroelectric power. We're just holding the country in trust for our descendants. We have to protect it for them and for all people, as caretakers. Iceland doesn't just belong to Icelanders but to the whole of mankind. Down in the valley, they see things differently. This is where they turn the water of the Kauran Yukar Lake into electricity.
Following a 40 kilometer journey through underground tunnels and with a drop height of 600 meters, the water from the reservoir lake arrives here in the power station. It flows through six large turbines. These convert the force of the water into electricity. The Kaura Nuka power station has an output of 690 megawatts, as much as a small nuclear power station. Apart from the power lines that go from here to the coast, the power station is invisible. No smoke, no nuclear waste, no greenhouse gases. But who needs so much energy in this almost deserted corner of the country? The electricity flows to the small town of Reda Fjordur. This is one of the biggest settlements in the east of the country. Even so, only about 1,100 Icelanders live here. Like the whole region, Radar Fjordur's major problem is that there are hardly any job prospects, especially for young people. Jobs were lost in the fishing industry through automation. A lot of people left and never came back. But the electricity attracted foreign investment to Radar Fjordur. The factory of the American aluminium concern Alcoa is only here because the dam was built in the highlands. The factory consumes the entire energy output of the hydroelectric power plant. We are a major employer, one of the biggest in Iceland. We have 900 employees in the factory, including young people who return after studying and get good jobs here, especially mechanical engineers and technicians. I'm one of them. I probably wouldn't have come back if the aluminium plant weren't here. The work in the aluminium plant is hot and noisy, and it's well paid. For the Icelanders, though, it's above all a means of exporting their electricity. It takes a great deal of electricity to create a chemical reaction between the huge electrodes made of carbon and the raw material aluminium oxide. From the melting tank, the workers draw off pure liquid aluminium at a temperature of 1,000 degrees. The metal solidifies into ingots, which are the base material for many products. Aircraft, cars, building materials, electricity lines, drinks cans. The raw material leaves here for customers around the world. Electricity in the form of aluminium bars. Iceland's gain is several hundred jobs, the money for the electricity bill, and some benefits for the local community. We've been able to build more than before, not just dwellings. We've also renovated our schools, our sports halls, swimming pools, and much more. 
not least of which is our harbour, the heart of the community. Yes, there were protests. But the biggest protesters didn't come from here and have never lived here. The nature conservationists in Mimi Gudbrandsson's group don't protest for protest's sake. They've no objection against some of the new hydroelectric power plants. What they're demanding is that the effects on nature must be carefully monitored and weighed up against the benefits. They constantly visit the new power stations and observe and document what they're doing to the countryside. We're concerned that the energy companies are working their way further and further up into the highlands. We have to say stop no further, because we believe that this area must not be sacrificed. An especially valuable area, worthy of protection, but at the same time highly contested, lies at the heart of the Icelandic highlands. On their way there, Mimi and his colleague Christine pass through a landscape that is already shaped by dams and reservoirs. The largest lake in Iceland, Torisvatn, has also been dammed. The national energy company, Landsvirkun, has already crept up to the edge of a former wetland. Tjors Auver is the name of this oasis, which has an area of over 120 square kilometers. Countless outflows from the nearby glacier cross the plain and form streams, pools and lakes. The biodiversity of this region is unusually rich for the Icelandic highlands. Though there's often snow on the ground from the end of September to the beginning of June, many plant species are established here. The animal world has also found a refuge here in the otherwise barren wasteland. The Arctic fox is the only one of the four Icelandic species of mammal that was already on the island before the arrival of man. Here, in Tjorsalver, it mainly hunts wild birds. This wetland habitat is one of the largest breeding grounds worldwide for the pink-footed goose. Up to 10,000 pairs nest here every year. But the highland oasis is not only of interest to ornithologists and botanists. The state-owned energy company, Landsvirkun, has had its eye on the area for over 30 years. Yeah. 
Mummy and the other nature conservationists are fighting a constant rearguard action. Tjursalver is of such interest to Landsvik Kjun because they already have many hydroelectric power stations further down. With a reservoir up here, they could channel even more water down below. The original plan was to flood all of this. Throughout the highlands, there are plans for new reservoirs and power stations. Each red dot on the map represents a project the energy companies have applied for to the government. If only half of them get built, then the highlands will just disappear, at least as we know them now. The atmosphere would change completely, like on a motorway. The Icelandic government has placed a protection order on Tjörsalver for the time being, but the habitat of the foxes, geese and countless plants is under constant pressure. <laughs> Landsvia Kuhn keeps trying to build a dam at least on the edge of the wetland. For the nature conservationists, the ecosystem is worth much more than a few new jobs in the aluminium industry. It's the water that's responsible for this biodiversity. And it's precisely the power of the water that the energy companies are trying to harness. We're fighting from two sides for the same thing. But are the majority of Icelanders prepared to forego the expansion of hydroelectric power? Because that would mean doing without secure revenues from major foreign investors. During the raging economic boom at the turn of the millennium, the Icelanders took everything that was going. Spurred on by dodgy financial deals, Reykjavik's skyline was punctured by new high-rise apartment blocks. The cars got bigger and bigger, and the luxury lifestyle was lived on credit. A vast, sparkling concert hall rose up in the old harbour district. The result? In 2008, the global financial crisis almost bankrupted the whole country. We survived for 1,100 years in this country by using whatever was at hand immediately. When they could go fishing, they went fishing, there and then. The bird had to be shot, there and then. We still haven't lost this mentality. We have to exploit all nature's treasures immediately, without seeing that the greatest natural treasure is this unique country itself. In the difficult times following the financial crisis, though, the Icelanders also came up with clever ideas that didn't call for foreign investment. First of all, really welcome to my farm, which is called uh, Friðheimar. My name is Knútur Ármann, and I live here with my family, growing tomatoes, little bit of cucumbers in our greenhouses. And it can maybe sound a little bit strange to be picking tomato every day of the year in Iceland, 
course, as you know, we have very long, dark and cold winter, but with the help from the nature, we can make it possible. Iceland's green energy can also be used for this. In Iceland, we don't only grow different tomato varieties, but also cucumbers, lettuce, herbs, strawberries, cut flowers, of course, and peppers. With light, heat and water, you can grow everything here. Iceland has water, electricity and heat galore. The heating in the greenhouses comes straight from the soil. At the end of the village, the farmers channel the water from a natural geyser straight into their system of pipes. Knutur's neighbour is the biggest producer of cut flowers in the country. Business only really boomed for Knutur and his colleagues a few years ago, when they installed artificial light everywhere. Now they're completely independent of daylight or the seasons. Using clean and cheap local energy like this also has enormous benefits for Icelandic society as a whole. Knutur and the other greenhouse farmers produce enough cucumbers and tomatoes to meet the needs of all Icelanders and also the tourists. Imports are not necessary. And the greenhouses also provide work the whole year round. Despite all the lights, no new dam and reservoir were needed for these jobs. And then we have something which we have been making from our tomatoes and cucumber in our little tomato shop. So please go around and have a look. Thank you very much and hope you will have a wonderful day today. With the Icelander's typical nose for business, Knutur has developed another very different source of income. He now serves food to over 50,000 tourists a year who come to see his greenhouses. That earns him even more than do his tomatoes and cucumbers. That's very much in line with the trend. More and more visitors come to the land of fire and ice every year. Icelanders now earn more from tourism than from aluminium or the traditionally important fishing industry. That was a good one. Tourists come to Iceland above all for the country's incomparably beautiful and unspoiled landscape. Even more dams, reservoirs and power lines don't square well with this image. Iceland has shown that renewable energies can meet an entire country's energy needs, and so cheaply that that in itself can become a problem. The Icelanders are at a crossroads. How much is nature worth to them? And how much of nature's power can they use without causing damage?
With imagination, though, tourism, nature, and the energy industry can work well together, as here on the Reykjanes Peninsula. The geothermic power station was built in 1978. Part of the plant's wastewater flowed directly onto the adjacent lava field. But instead of draining away, it formed a milky artificial pool, rich in minerals. It was the locals who first discovered that the power plant water was perfect for bathing. This then developed into a business opportunity. The power plant now delivers enough geothermic water from deep in the earth to operate a world-famous thermal spa, the Blue Lagoon. Iceland is an example for the whole world that climate-friendly, emission-free energy provision does not automatically produce a green paradise. You need inventiveness and ingenuity to achieve real sustainability.